October 1950, the Communist Party Dissolution Act received the Royal Assent and passed into law. The Act happened to be uh, the first significant piece of legislation passed by the Mentor Liberal Party government, uh, which had come to power on the 10th of December 1949. I think Neil told us that uh, they promised this was what they were going to do, uh, and that's what they did. <coughs> Uh, the Act uh, at the time sought to suppress communism in Australia, ban the Australian Communist Party, and penalise communists or those thought to be communists or communist sympathisers. Uh, by a number of recitals in the preamble to the Act, uh, the Commonwealth sought to set up the necessary connection with a constitutional head of power. Uh, there are nine paragraphs in the preamble, and they set out uh, what they wanted to do. I'll just read to you some of them because it sets out the, sort of, the breadth of um, the audacity of the government of the day uh, and the, uh, uh, the strength with which it sought to, uh, to get rid of uh, what it saw as um, uh, one of its major political enemies. Now, the preamble um, um, went through some, some formal um, areas and then it said, and whereas the Australian Communist Party in accordance with the basic theory of communism as expounded by Marx and Lenin engages in activities or operations designed to assist or accelerate the coming of a revolutionary situation, the Australian Communist Party acting as a revolutionary, revolutionary minority be able to seize power and establish a dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, and whereas the Australian Communist Party also engages in activities or operations designed to bring about the overthrow or dislocation of the established system of government of Australia and the attainment of economic, industrial, or political ends by force, violence, intimidation, or fraudulent processes. And whereas the Australian Communist Party is an integral part of the World Communist Revolutionary Movement, which in the King's Dominions and elsewhere engaged in espionage and sabotage and in activities or operations of a treasonable or subversive nature, and also engaged in activities or operations similar to those, or having an object similar to the object of those, referred to in the last two preceding paragraphs of this preamble. And it goes on in that vein, you get the, you get the idea. Uh, it certainly sets the Communist Party up as um, the most dangerous organisation uh, that Australia had ever seen. Probably um, somewhat loftier than the practice of, of communism in those days. Um, now, there are obviously a number of people here today, and we've heard from some of those people who recall the immediate impact uh, of the legislation and of course the anti-communist hysteria which preceded it. Um, one of those who's not here today is the great Australian judge Michael Kirby. Now he told uh, uh, the, some students at the University of Western Sydney in 2005 uh, about his personal reflection on the passing of the Act. It's what Michael Kirby said, in 1950 the Parliament of Australia enacted the Communist Party Dissolution Act. As it happened, Michael was 12 years late or so at the time. As it happened, the act had particular significance for my family. This came about because my grandmother had remarried and her new husband was a communist. He was a man who had fought at Gallipoli, where he won a military medal. It was conferred on him at Buckingham Palace by King George V. My new uncle was a very fine man. In my youth, I experienced the discordance of knowing him as a human being and as, a, as an idealistic man with a strong commitment to social justice, and knowing the hatred that existed in our community at the time towards communists and anyone who supported them. The hatred was expressed in part in a law that was enacted by the Federal Parliament with, it should be said, the full support of a mandate from the people given to R.G. Menzies, the Prime Minister, and the government that he led. There's a very interesting number of people that were touched uh, in that way uh, by the, uh, the passing of the legislation. Now, the Communist Party Dissolution Act had, of course, been uh, some time in the making. 
uh, and the reaction of the Communist Party and the unions with the Communist officials was swift. Uh, on the 90th of, of October 1950, the day before the act became law, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald uh, recorded the Australian Communist Party and 10 Communist controlled unions planned to challenge the validity of the bill. Immediately it was proclaimed. Uh, Mr. Fish, interesting name for Solicitor Admin for the Communist Party, <laughs> announced on the instructions of the Australian Communist Party, all steps have been taken to apply to the High Court for an interim injunction and to challenge the constitutional validity of the Communist Party Dissolution Act. Immediately the Royal Assent is given. And he announced that various counsel have been briefed. Uh, and a firm called Jolly Smith and Company issued a statement of similar effect on behalf of a number of unions. So the battle lines were drawn and they were drawn smartly. Uh, proceedings were indeed commenced on the day after the bill passed into law. Uh, it appears that the Communist Party and all the union parties obtained an interim injunction, uh, a very brief injunction, and the hearing of an application for an interlocutory order came before Mr Justice Dixon on the 25th of October 1950. It was then that Dr Herbert B. Rebbe, then Deputy Leader of the Opposition, made a surprise appearance on behalf of the Waterside Workers' Federation. Uh, the Barrier Minor, it's the, uh, the Breaker Hill newspaper, reported that Garfield Barwick, uh, KC, on behalf of the Commonwealth, advised the court that the Commonwealth would not object to an interlocutory injunction restraining the Commonwealth from enforcing the provisions of the Act, that is, until the final hearing, provided that the judge required the plaintiffs to employ every expedition in preparing their case. Now, that expedition was certainly achieved because the hearing of the plaintiff's case uh, commenced on the 14th of November uh, 1950, some few weeks later. The matter formally proceeded as a case stated. Uh, whereby Justice Dixon uh, posed two questions for the determination of the full court, that is the full court of seven judges. Now those two um, questions were, firstly, uh, does the decision of the question of the validity or invalidity of the provisions of the Communist Bay Dissolution Act depend upon a judicial determination or ascertainment of the facts or any of them stated uh, in the recital from the preamble. Uh, and those facts, of course, were denied by the plaintiffs, the plaintiffs being the Communist Party or the unions. Uh, the second part of that question was, are the plaintiffs entitled to reduce evidence in support of their denial of the facts so stated in order to establish that the Act is outside the legislative power of the Commonwealth? The second question was, if no, to either part in question one, are the provisions of the Communist Pay Dissolution Act invalid either in whole or in some part uh, affecting in the way it affects the plaintiffs? Um, the case, of course, um, I don't think there's any doubt about this, was uh, the most important case, certainly the most important constitutional case of its era. It was also one of the longest. The hearing took place in Sydney over 24 separate days uh, between the 14th of November and the 19th of December 1950. 1,465 pages of transcript were produced. Uh, the decision occupies 285 pages in the Commonwealth Law Reports. Uh, the case for the Commonwealth was led by Bali. Uh, supported by uh, three King's Council, Taylor, Lindia and Lewis, and six juniors. Of the Commonwealth legal team, uh, Barwick, Taylor and Lindia were all later appointed to the High Court, and four of the juniors were later appointed to the State Supreme Court. Uh, the Communist Party and two of its members, uh, being uh, Mrs Gibson and Campbell, were represented by uh, uh, Fred Patterson, uh, of the Queensland Bar and the Peach Glory of the Victorian Bar, both of whom uh, addressed the court, as well as by uh, Ted Hill and Max Julius. Uh, Ever appeared for the Waterside Workers uh, and for Jim Healy, its secretary, as well as for the Federated Iron Workers uh, Association and Secretary Jack Phillips. Uh, Isaac's KC and 
Sullivan appeared for uh, those parties as well. Um, the other unions that were involved were the Siemens Union and the Sheet Metal Workers Union and the Federated Ship Painters and Dockers represented by Isaacs, KC and Julius, the ARU and Brown, uh, and Palmer and others suing on behalf of the Building Workers Industrial Union uh, and they just purse, represented by Ashkenazi, KC and Laurie, the Australian Amalgamated Engineering Union, Australian Section and Rowe, represented by Western KC and Collins, the Australian Coal and Shale Employees Federation and Williams, represented by Webb, KC and Sullivan, and the Federated Clerks Union of Australia, New South Wales Branch, and Hughes, uh, who had intervened by leave, represented by Hardy, KC and Sullivan. Council filled the bar table, as well as the first five rows of the public gallery. <laughs> That was a lawyer's picnic. Um, as to the arguments that were put forward, unusually, um, it was the respondent being the Commonwealth uh, through Barwick that addressed the court first. Uh, Barwick at that time was the leader of the uh, Australian Bar. Uh, he was at the top of his game. Uh, he had recently had uh, significant victories in the High Court of Privy Council in the Bank Nationalisation case. Um, and we will know a little bit about his later um, political um, history. The Bowie based his argument essentially on, on the defence power. He said that uh, the Communist Party Dissolution Act was sound because it possessed a rational and logical connection with the defence power. It was necessary to pass that act in order to protect uh, the country against this uh, marauding force of communism, which was out to destabilise the, the peace. Uh, and security of the Australian um, population. He also argued that it was supported by the executive power in section 61 of the Constitution, which was, uh, if any, if, if I've ever seen a long boat rule, that was it. Because the section 61, all, all of that says is that uh, um, it uh, gives the uh, Commonwealth power uh, to uh, execute and maintain the Constitution and the laws of the Commonwealth. He threw in the incidental power at uh, section 5139 of the Constitution for the right. This is a sort of a roving in provision. Um, and then, then went to the logical extreme of all that and said that the act was supported by the Commonwealth powers arising from its existence as a body policy. It's about a certain remark. Yeah. Anyhow, um, Barwick um, didn't have it all his own way, of course. Um, he was, he was uh, ably supported by the Chief Justice, John Bacon, who of course had had a long history before he came to the High Court as a, uh, a conservative politician. Uh, he'd been um, a cabinet member, I think, in the Bruce Lyons government and had been for a short period of time the leader of the opposition. Uh, the other members of the court gave up a pretty hard time. Uh, Mr Justice Williams at one point during the argument asked Barley, then does that mean that Parliament could say that the existence of John Smith, an ordinary citizen, was a menace to the security of Australia and required that he be shot at door? Barley said, well, no, you're wrong. Kiddo, uh, uh, Mr Justice Kiddo suggested to Barley uh, in no uncertain terms, you cannot have punishment that is preventative. You can't remove his tongue to stop him speaking against you. That is wide open to a totalitarian state. So for, for what we regard as, as pretty conservative men in their time, um, they uh, soon came to realise the, uh, the depth to which um, Barwick's argument was, um, was progressing. Barwick's argument was um, ultimately uh, reduced uh, to the following propositions. Um, the bona fides of Parliament cannot be challenged by the High Court, and thus logically neither could the recitals. Uh, evidence produced by each plaintiff may have led to differing findings as to the validity of the legislation, and only the reasoning and motivation of Parliament and not objective facts were relevant in determining whether the act was within Commonwealth power. It's probably appropriate at this point that to uh, refer to what the Act actually 
sought to achieve uh, because uh, something I think when we go through that, that we realise what an extraordinarily uh, far-reaching and draconian piece of legislation uh, it, it was at the time. Section 4 of the Act sought to declare that the uh, Australian Communist Party is an unlawful association and by virtue of that fact dissolve it. Um, this is another example of the, um, the Commonwealth reciting itself into power or attempting to. At that point, the property of the Australian Communist Party would be seized by uh, the appointment of a receiver, uh, and that property would ultimately um, go to the state. In, um, Section 5 said that um, uh, any body of persons, corporate or, or unincorporate, not being an industrial organisation, uh, registered under the law of the Commonwealth, which is or reports to be or at any time after the specified date and before the date of the commencement of this Act, was or reported to be affiliated uh, with the Australian Communist Party, or which supports or advocates um, the objectives, policies, teaching or principles or practices of communism as expounded by Marx uh, or Lenin, uh, or has a policy which is directed, controlled, shaped or influenced wholly or substantially by persons who held any of those beliefs, uh, would be a kind of declared organisation would suffer a similar, similar fate uh, to the Communist Party. Now, all of that was to be determined on the satisfaction of the Governor General. Subsection 2 of that section saying, where the Governor General is satisfied that a body of persons is a body of persons to which this section applies, and that the continued existence of that body of persons would be prejudicial to the security and defence of the Commonwealth, or to the execution or maintenance of the Constitution, or of the laws of the Commonwealth. The Governor General may, by instrument published in the Gazette, declare that body of persons to be an unlawful association. That body would then, by virtue of Section 6, be dissolved, and uh, Section 7 and sub, uh, subsequent sections would prevent anybody attempting to act on behalf of that body. Section 9 applied to individuals. Section 9 applied to any person who was at any time uh, after a specified date and before the date upon which the, the uh, party was dissolved, a member of the party, or who was at any time after the date, communist, or where the Governor General was satisfied that, um, and where the Governor General was satisfied that that person was uh, a person in that way or was likely to engage in activities prejudicial to the security and defence of the Commonwealth, uh, would make a declaration accordingly. Now, first of all, in respect of uh, when the declaration was enforced, so says Section 10, was incapable of holding offices in a union or was incapable of being employed uh, in any Commonwealth uh, job. So you can see that uh, uh, how far reaching the legislation was. Um, so I think what Barwick was, uh, was attempting to do. Um, then the plaintiffs were heard. Um, Professor George Williams wrote a paper in 1993 as a junior academic um, about the Communist Party case, of course. George is, in my view, one of the great constitutional scholars in this country. Um, it was his view that, despite the number of claims and despite the, uh, uh, the differing approaches that uh, they took, that uh, there was a surprising degree of coherence in the arguments. Uh, Mr. Laurie opened the, the argument for the Communist Party. Uh, he argued that the Dissolution Act was too wide to be characterised as a law with respect to defence. Uh, Fred Patterson also uh, uh, addressed the court. Fred Patterson contended that the Constitution embodied a system of representative and responsible government and that the Constitution had to be read in such a way that the federal government could not interfere with the political rights of the electors or with political organisations. <coughs> now, George Williams uh, 
says it said in the newspaper that Patterson's arguments were intensely radical arguments in that respect for 1950. Uh, the High Court again hitherto accepted those, but um, the, in this view, one of the view that I share, the High Court now, certainly since the early 1990s, uh, has come to um, uh, accept uh, that uh, approach uh, to legislation that strikes at um, the fundamental political rights that uh, are either expressly or impliedly set out in the Constitution. That, that uh, I suggest, um, is one of those um, stories which goes to demonstrate uh, what a brilliant man Patterson was. Um, Laurie and Patterson were given a pretty hard time by the bench as well. Um, unfortunately for, um, for Fred Patterson, um, while he was a great lawyer, he was also a politician and uh, uh, his, um, uh, his later uh, submissions uh, degenerated largely into political speech making um, and in some cases uh, uh, some clashes with the bench. I'll just read you one brief example here. Uh, I mean, it was too much for, uh, for Fred, having listened to uh, Latham um, intervene on a number of occasions to try and save Darwin uh, behind. Um, that uh, he finally thought he'd get stuck with the label himself. Patterson said this, uh, the remarks to the public leader have been to the effect that if Russia wants, she can overrun Europe in two or three weeks. She does not want to. She's not ready for war yet. Uh, Latham then said to him, you are asking us to take judicial notice of a good deal more than Mr. Barwick ever suggested. Latham said, no, I'm simply saying, <laughs> Latham said, if you're simply saying it's that it does not matter. It is not part of a legal argument. Apparently that, that sort of um, exchange went on for some time. Uh, Ebert, of course, effectively led the case of the plaintiffs uh, and other counsels attempted to, to refer to him. Uh, Ebert wasn't sure of the word. He spoke for 10 days. <laughs> The, the general consensus is that Ebert started very strongly, uh, shot all these good arguments in the first couple of days and then uh, um, rather degenerated into repetition and, and uh, became somewhat disjointed after that. But uh, because Ebert was also uh, a very fine lawyer, um, he of course fastened on the, the principal argument uh, which was eventually going to defeat the legislation. Um, and that was that the dissolution act had no real and substantial connection with the defence of Australia, and that the opinion about that, whether there was a substantial um, uh, connection, certainly couldn't be left to the personal opinion of the Governor General. His uh, submissions, um, um, in one way, might be summarised in this way. He said to the court, I put this to the court and I submit it can be driven home and it cannot be answered. It is impossible to base its qualifications and loss of civil rights and expropriation of property, all of which is worked by this Act of Parliament upon the mere opinion of the Executive Government. The High Court reserved its decision for about three months, delivering it on the 9th of March 1951. By a majority of six to one, the Court held that the Commons Bay Dissolution Act was wholly invalid. Uh, Chief Justice Latham was the sole dissenter. Five of the judges uh, answered no to the first question and yes to the second question. Uh, only Justice Webb answered yes to the first question he considered alone that the evidence had to be adduced by the Commonwealth to prove the accuracy of the recitals. The rest of the court, uh, the rest of the five, the rest of the majority said uh, the recitals aren't something we, we, we can uh, 
we can adjudicate on your data to uh, bring evidence about the need that the stock recitals were correct, the act would still be invalid. Uh, the majority found the Commonwealth had not established a proper connection between the act and the defence of the Commonwealth and the, re and the recitals were of no probative value. October 1950 was seen as a time of relative peace. The arguments concerning the executive and incidental powers were rejected in a decision which placed importance on the impropriety of using those powers to trench upon important civil liberties. Now, Justice Dixon was a pretty conservative man. He's regarded by many as Australia's greatest judge. He summed up that position about civil liberties uh, in the following passage. History and not only ancient history, shows that in countries where democratic institutions have been unconstitutionally superseded, that has been done not seldom by those holding the executive power. Forms of government may need protection from dangers likely to arise from within the institution to be protected. In point of constitutional theory, the power to legislate for the protection of an existing form of government ought not to be based in the conception if otherwise adequate, adequate only to assist those holding power to resist or suppress obstruction or opposition or attempts to displace them for the form of government they defend. The decision no doubt um, came as a relief uh, to the party uh, and to its members. Um, Michael Kirby also remembers uh, as a young boy the decision. find the passage I'll read it to. I remember the day of the High Court decision. I was 12 years of age at the time. Of course, I didn't know the nuances at that stage. I didn't then spend my life reading Commonwealth Law Reports. It is later. <laughs> but I knew that somehow a great cloud had been lifted over my grandmother's new husband, Uncle Jack, as I called him. I knew that he called him a faraway place and pronounced orders that meant that he was not in danger of having to hide. He was not in danger of being arrested or losing his civil rights in Australia. He was entitled to go about his affairs and to propound his views as a communist. It was a liberating feeling for me and my family. I have never forgotten that feeling. Many members of the Australian Communist Party later became very disillusioned with communism and the Communist Party, especially after the uprisings in Europe in the 1960s. However, there is no doubt that people like my Uncle Jack were idealists. They had an opinion. In effect, the High Court of Australia said the way to fight that opinion was to fight it with other opinions and with other points of view. It was not to deprive a voice to those who held dissident opinions. And of course, it was the, uh, the father of um, the Menzies the government to uh, enact uh, a constitutionally valid piece of legislation which led to, to the, uh, the referendum. I want to say a little bit about the legacy of, of the Communist Party case um, um, in this country. Um, it was obviously a seminal case in Australian legal history. Uh, in my view, it should be seen as an important but by no means isolated example of the importance placed by this country's highest court on principles which preserve civil liberties and fundamental freedoms. Importantly, the case stands as part of a continuum of decisions which insist upon the High Court's role as the arbiter of constitutional power, thereby restraining the excesses of the executive and rejecting outright the notion that the legislature or the executive can determine the limits of its own power. In other words, the High Court will continue to reserve to itself the power to review the lawfulness of executive power. Communist Party uh, cases have been much cited in the intervening 60 years, particularly an important case of dealing with the executive's right to infringe upon the freedom and liberty of not only the subjects but those who come to, to our shores seeking refuge. Uh, let me take a couple of examples. 
And in a case called Plaintiff S157 of 2002 in the Commonwealth, uh, it was supported in, it was cited in support of a decision which confirmed the court's capacity to judicially review decisions under the Migration Act, uh, even in circumstances where the legislature had sought to deal the court uh, out of the equation by uh, enacting what are called privilege clauses which sought to make certain decisions about refugee status under the Migration Act unreviewable by any court. And in that case, um, it was said that uh, the Australian Constitution is framed upon the assumption of the rule of law. The case that was cited in support of that proposition was the Communist Party case. Uh, further in, in that uh, uh, case, it said the provision of constitutional rights and the conferral upon this court of an irremovable jurisdiction to issue them to an officer of the Commonwealth constitutes a textual reinforcement for what Justice Dixon said about the significance of the rule of law for the Constitution in the Australian Communist Party uh, the Commonwealth. Some of you might remember uh, a case involving Jack Thomas in 2007 where Jack Thomas was uh, said to be a, a terrorist or a possible terrorist and um, uh, a control order under the then new um, legislation was imposed on Jack Thomas. Jack challenged that in the High Court. He challenged the imposition of the control orders and he said that control orders were valid uh, constitutionally. Jack wasn't successful. Um, uh, the High Court ruled uh, 5 to 2 uh, that the legislation allowing for the imposition of control of the suspected terrorist was valid. Uh, the dissenters were, not surprisingly, Justice Kirby, but surprisingly, Justice Ken Hay, uh, traditionally regarded as a very conservative man from Victoria. Now, both of those dissenters made reference to the Communist Party case. Um, And uh, Justice Kirby said this. This court's reasons in the Communist Party case of the Federal Parliament could not recite itself into power. Uh, yet it is notable that Section 51, uh, subsection 6, was not specifically relied on as a source of power on which the validity of the provision in question was be sustained. And he referred to the reasoning in the Communist Party case, and he said, the reasoning in the Communist Party case is particularly opposite to the present case. In many respects, the contemporary concerns about terrorism are analogous to the fears earlier expressed about communism leading to the enactment, the enactment of the Communist Party Dissolution Act. Now, Justice Haining said this, questions about how to identify the relevant statutory purpose for central issues in the Communist Party case. They are questions that must be considered in the present matter. It is therefore convenient now uh, to examine what was decided in the Communist Party case. He went on to talk about uh, uh, the case in some detail. And he said, what was said of it? in the Communist Party case about the relevance of factual inquiries proposed by the plaintiffs to a consideration of the applicability of the defence power must be understood uh, in this light. What it reveals is the critical importance attached to the dissolution act's effect on the status, property, and civil rights of persons nominatum or by other identification without any external test of liability on which the connection of the provisions with power will depend. Um, that's, one of the, that's one of the most interesting um, judgments in the case, in my view, because you've got a man uh, hitherto regarded as a very conservative man relying upon principles derived from the Communist Party case to argue that uh, control of the on people merely suspected of terrorism in the view of the executive government were not lawful. Finally, in South Australia, in Tatani, uh, uh, the 
Commonwealth, sorry, the South Australian government sought to ban um, people involved in biking um, organisations. The legislation which was proposed in that case allowed the Commissioner of Police, uh, if satisfied that members of an organisation associated to commit serious crime which threatens public safety, to make a declaration in respect of that organisation. Once that declaration was made, a control order could then be made by the magistrates for prohibiting association between members of the declared organisation. Now, of course, the potential for that legislation to be applied to legal organisations, um, uh, as well as uh, motorbike clubs, is, uh, is quite obvious. Now, the High Court in that case found that in making a control order, the, the South Australian magistrates were being used as a tool of the executive thereby requiring to act in a fashion incompatible with the proper discharge of its federal judicial responsibilities and requiring it to perform functions which were repugnant to the institutional integrity of the court. Uh, not surprisingly, the Communist Party case was cited in the judgments. Again, the Communist Party case was relied upon as, as uh, uh, the authority uh, to the effect that the Australian Constitution was framed upon the assumption of the rule of law. Of course, it's the rule of law that protects equal uh, rights before the law and protects the, um, uh, the preservation of fundamental human rights and freedoms. The Communist Party case um, uh, is an incredibly important case. The last word on it, um, I'll leave to, again, Michael Kirby. Now, Michael's never been a communist. Uh, he is, in fact, an imperialist. Uh, but he's also a defender of human rights uh, and a man who, of course, might understand something about being an outsider. Uh, he has, throughout his career, been a staunch advocate of the rights of political, social and cultural minorities to enjoy their freedom of expression and practice uh, provided it is within the law. Michael Kirby said this uh, in 2005. Chief Justice Latham rightly said in all of Cromwell's words, being comes before well-being. However, the lesson of the Communist Party case in Australia in 1951 where those words were written by the Chief Justice, is that being, is that part of being in Australia is well-being. Part of being for us is liberty. That has been part of the <coughs> constitutional fabric, and we should keep it so. It is important that we should be no less vigilant today in 2005 in ensuring that liberty under law remains true in Australia, as in other countries where distinguished judges uh, whom I have quoted. Now is not a time to falter in constitutional fundamentals. Whenever we have doubts, we should reread the High Court's decision on the Communists and maintain the same commitment, evident in that case, a commitment to the rule of law and the protection of basic human rights and fundamental freedoms. Normally, our constitution and laws are followed by the government. And wherever there is doubt, the courts of Australia should err on the side of liberty. Always. Thank you. Now we've got time for one or two questions or points to be made about Bob's presentation if anybody wants to. Would you like to see all that? Thank you. No. We've always been eyes glazed over. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to uh, thank our... Well, well, I do have one. I recall reading this some time ago, and I've got to do the executive power, and perhaps you can call me on it. The author said it means he was a lawyer, and he knew that the High Court would drive a horse and cart through the act. Therefore, the conclusion was... Menzies was using it to smear the working class movement. Could you comment on that? Please? I have a vague recollection of, of reading that quote somewhere myself. Yeah. Um, I, I would be the last person on the planet to know what was in Robert Menzies' mind. 
at any time. Um, I've got a poster hanging on my wall, big eye and bob headed last, don't you really class mourns as dead heroes. <laughs> but um, I don't know, I, no, I think I think Menzies, I mean Menzies is a very fine lawyer. Menzies uh, you know, if he one of the, the, the engineers case is a junior at the age of twenty five. Um, and um, but I think he and he was also um Arlen Gibson's first pupil, interestingly enough. Um, but I, I, think he pro- I think he probably thought, uh, as, as many politicians have subsequently, that these judges were conservative enough to give him a letter. He underestimated, he underestimated the court in the same way I think that um, the conservatives who appointed Anthony Mason and William Dean to the High Court seriously underestimated their commitments to things like civil liberties and and, and a, a broad and uh, expansive view of how the law can protect people. And I think that's probably, um, I think that's probably closer to it. We might, we might, one, one, one might be right, you know, the truth might be somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Well, just, I suppose, what follows on from that, do you think that the recent case in regard to offshore processing do you have anything can in any way be related back to this case? I think, it's in, I think it's very much in the same stream of, of um, ensuring that um, the executive doesn't um, over, overreach itself. Um, what the High Court is, I mean, for, for, all your, for all criticisms we have about, about present political system, it, it relies upon the separation of powers, and the, and the High Court has never been. Uh, as it demonstrated in the, high, in the uh, Communist Party case, the High Court's never been afraid by the majority. And there, are always, there are always a couple of, of, of you know, capital C conservatives who, who hold, will try and hold their line. But the High Court's never generally been afraid to say to the, um, uh, the executive, you've gone too far here, yeah, you simply can't um, act in the way that you have. Uh, it's, it's either in excess of the Constitution or that what you're pretending to do um, doesn't have any basis in the powers that you've uh, that, that you sort of described yourself. And that's the, the, the offshore processing case is very much um, in that, that stream of cases. I mean, um, uh, yeah, what, the, uh, what the Minister sought to do there uh, was to... Um, Say that well, it's okay to send people to Malaysia because I've had a chat to the fellow in Malaysia and he says we're really trying to do a good job here, you know. We haven't, we actually haven't got any any uh, legislation that protects refugees. In fact, anybody who comes to the country without a permit is illegal. But you know, but we're thinking we're thinking seriously about improving our human rights record, and that that was the basis upon which the minister decided that it was going to be okay to send people to. Malaysia. Now what the court said, well hang on a minute. What, what you've got is a piece of legislation here which is, which is um, um, the, um, the domestic uh, enactment of our obligations under the Refugee Convention and that requires you to, to uh, provide actual protections. That requires you to be satisfied that there are actual protections. You simply can't be satisfied on the basis of some um, uh, aspirational statement Made, made by the, the politician in Malaysia. So it's very much about that. It's very much about, about not accepting at, at face value what the executive says and, and, and scrutinising it for some here and, and applying um, uh, an appropriate set of legal principles to it. Okay, um, I'd like everyone to thank our learned comment.
tell him, do you know the librarian? I think her name is Nancy. She was at the, she was the librarian at the Fryer Library for years and years. And she's still in the Union Choir, even though she must be nearly 90. And she, she was just telling me the other day, she sang in the Union Choir in the big cathedral down there in St John's. Yes, yes. And she, she was the stalwart at the Fryer Library. No deal, everybody. No deal! We must have a good word. 